For the international release of Super Mario Bros. 2, Nintendo elected to take the Japanese game Doki Doki Panic and turn it into a Mario game. In addition to swapping some graphics and music, Nintendo also elected to give Mario 2 a few minor enhancements. We are fortunate to have access to a prototype from earlier in the conversion process that gives us a glimpse into the game's evolution. Nintendo's extra enhancements would certainly add to the polish of the final game, but it seems like perhaps many of them were a bit rushed. I'd like to take a behind the scenes look at these enhancements, point out a few of the bugs, and also just have a bit of fun with some of the code. Since this video is going to dive into hexadecimal and code, it will get a bit technical. That said, I think it shouldn't be too difficult to follow. Before we do that, let me catch you up a bit on that prototype I mentioned. If you are familiar with Mario 2, you'll no doubt notice that this prototype Mario is missing the white behind his eyes. As a matter of fact, the face of the Mario sprite looks quite a bit like the Super Mario sprite from Super Mario Bros. 3. The heads in these two screenshots seem to match quite well. The final head for Mario in Mario 2 would, of course, end up looking like this. Both Prototype Mario and Retail Release Mario made the first issue of Nintendo Power. If you look at the pages for the game, you'll find both the Prototype Mario head and the Retail Mario head in the screenshots. That's a nice bit of documented history for this game that would seem to be unintentional. Mario 2 was released in America in October of 1988. Mario 3 was released in Japan that same month. It would make sense that there would be sprite sharing between the two during development. There are a couple of musical differences between the prototype and the retail release. One example is that the music that plays when you get the star lacks some of the extra percussion that was added a bit later. A second and perhaps more noteworthy difference is the underground theme. The retail release would end up sounding similar to the Doki Doki Panic version. However, in the prototype, it sounds very similar to Mario 3's arrangement of the original underground theme. Speaking of music, let's dive into the retail version and have some fun. The primary game mechanic of Mario 2 is the ability to pull items out of the ground and throw them at enemies. One item that can be extracted is a potion that allows you to enter subspace through a red door. The grass tufts in this area yield coins, and you may also find a mushroom that increases your maximum health. A few seconds of the original Super Mario Bros. theme can be heard during the brief time you are allowed inside. That time in subspace is maybe 6 seconds. We know there is more to the original Mario 1 theme than the few bars that we hear during those seconds. Is more of the Mario 1 tune present in Mario 2? I'm going to use the debugger features of the emulator FCEUX to investigate. This music question has been asked and answered before, but we are more interested in the investigation itself more than the final answer. On the left side of the screen is a map of the NES RAM. It is used to store various values as Mario 2 performs its tasks. RAM is a great thing to use to help lift the curtain and see what is happening behind the scenes during gameplay, especially if you want to watch it in real time like we are right now. Since your time is limited while in subspace, it makes sense that there would be a timer kept somewhere in RAM that keeps track of how much time is remaining until it forces you to exit. We can find it by simply watching the RAM and looking for changes. This RAM viewer has a feature that highlights activity in red to make it easier to see where changes are occurring. After a bit of observation, it looks like the countdown is happening here, at address 4B7. Once it reaches zero, we are booted out of subspace. I didn't do anything technical here besides watch the RAM while I was in subspace to see if I could find a counter. I have a save state just before Mario entered subspace, so let's reload it, enter the door, and pause the emulator. Okay, the timer has been set to start at 60 hex. Let's manually edit the RAM to increase the timer from that starting point of 60 to a much larger value of FF, the maximum 8-bit number, to increase the time we are in subspace. And... Hey, there is a lot more of the theme, isn't there? 
I've always enjoyed this rendition of the Mario 1 theme, and it is nice to hear more of it. In the case of modifying RAM in order to listen to the rest of the music, we just waited until the program set the value of the timer as we entered subspace and changed it to a higher value. While this was an easy way to get it to do what we wanted, it would be nice to not have to interrupt the timer and edit RAM manually. Perhaps it would be best to modify the code so it sets the timer to a higher value for us. So we're going to move the location of our change from RAM to ROM to the area where the game's code resides, and I'll walk you through this part. Since we know the location in RAM for the timer, we can set a breakpoint in the code for any time the value at this location is updated. We also know that the moment it is set to our starting value happens right after we enter the door to subspace. If you look inside the 6502 debugger window to the left of the game, the code is in the long box on the left. To the right of the code are various numbers we can monitor as well as numerous features we can use. Breakpoints allow us to specify conditions that will halt execution of the game the moment those conditions are met. This will give us an opportunity to make observations or even make changes on the fly. So let's click the Add button here and add a breakpoint for our timer location in RAM, address 4B7. We are looking for a write to that location, the moment when the game sets the timer to 60, so we will check the write box. Let's leave conditions blank for simplicity. Now back to the game window. Let's walk through that red door. Okay, we hit a breakpoint and execution halted. Let's look at the code window on the left. The instruction STA stores the value from A, which you can see in this box over here, to the specified address location. Since the value of A is currently zero, this statement appears to serve as an initialization. You can see we are storing the value in A to several other locations at this point in code as well, initializing them all to zero. So this is not quite where we set our timer start value. We'll click run and continue execution. Ah, we've reached the next breakpoint and this one looks promising. We are once again storing the value in A to our timer location, but this time we loaded a hex value of 60 into A in the previous instruction. This is the starting value for the timer that we observed in RAM earlier. This LDA statement at address 95A1 is what sets our timer's start value to 60 hex. Since we just passed over that LDA command that loads 60 hex into A, let's change the value over here in the A box to FF the same long timer value I jammed into RAM earlier. Keep your eye on 4B7 in RAM and I will click step over to execute just the next instruction, our STA instruction here. Aha, we have loaded FF into RAM just like earlier, but we did it by hijacking the code with our debugger instead of directly editing the RAM. If I disable the breakpoint and continue execution, you can see the longer timer counting down as expected. We found it. So the code we are interested in is the instruction LDA at address 95A1 and the hex value of 60 right next to it at address 95A2. While the debugger lets me edit code and change the value the LDA instruction uses, let's try a different approach, one that doesn't require our direct intervention at all. I no longer need the debugger or the RAM viewer because I have the address with the value I want to change, the unmodified original value and the desired value I would like it to be. I don't want the music in subspace to repeat, so I'm going to shorten the desired start value to D2. That's about enough time to hear the last little note of the Mario 1 melody and then transition back into the regular music. From this point, there are several options to push this new timer start value. One option might be to modify the Mario 2 ROM file itself with our change. A second option would be to create a cheat code to patch the ROM on the fly. Several emulators have a way to generate these codes given the necessary criteria. We know the criteria, so let's use the cheat search tool to plug in our numbers. Address is 95A2. The value we want to set it to be is D2. The compare field is where we put our original value of 60 hex. Now we'll click add. This cheat is now set to automatically activate when I load up Mario 2 in the emulator. I can use this checkbox to turn it on and off. But perhaps what is more interesting here is that the software generated the appropriate Game Genie code to do the same thing. So if you have a Game Genie and desire enough time to hear the full Mario 2 arrangement of the Mario 1 theme while you are inside subspace, just use this code. 
It isn't too difficult to create a Game Genie code manually by translating our address and values into the appropriate letter sequence, but I thought we would let the emulator do it for us since the feature is built into the software. As for Mario 2 itself, I should point out that picking up a mushroom in subspace interrupts the music in order to play a short tune, and of course increasing the time in subspace takes away from the challenge of pulling as many coins as you can before the timer expires. That said, I hope hearing the full theme in subspace will put a smile on your face. In the prototype version of Super Mario Bros. 2, each playable character was made up of four tiles, just like Doki Doki Panic. Two tiles are used for the head, and two tiles are used for the body. Three solid colors plus one for transparency are used for each tile. Nintendo elected to enhance the graphical appearance of the characters and add whites to the eyes of each of them via a fifth sprite consisting of a white block and placing that block behind the head tiles. Here we are again at our spot next to the vine. Stepping in front of the door demonstrates what I assume to be a sprite priority issue between the door and the white block for the eyes. While this demonstrates that the fifth white block sprite does exist, let's make it more obvious. If you look at line 220 here in our RAM window, locations 220, 224, 228, and 22C represent the vertical location for Mario's left head tile, right head tile, left body tile, and right body tile. If you watch them when Mario jumps, they decrease as he goes up. We're going to lock them in place. This RAM window lets me freeze values. So let's change the vertical values of the head tiles to each be 1F, change the vertical values of the body tiles to each be 2F, and freeze all four values. Now, all that is left is the white block that goes behind the eyes. Since the game will still function normally, we can now play as a floating white block. <laughs> This is rather challenging, but it is doable. It reminds me of Adventure for the Atari 2600. Since Mario's head normally bobs as he walks, so does the little white block. Any item Mario carries will still appear above where his head normally would be. Since we didn't freeze the graphics for the tiles, Mario's body continues to animate the way it should. It just does so locked at the same vertical position at the top of the screen. This also lets us observe another bit of trivia. If you watch the Mario sprite at the top when I jump off this cliff to trigger a death, you'll notice that it still updates to the oh no, small dying Mario like you see when you run out of health. We never see this under normal circumstances, but the sprite change is most likely part of any death sequence. Okay, we'll unfreeze these values and get Mario back to normal, at least for the moment. We're going to mess with the graphical references a bit. Let's return to our 220 line in RAM. The value immediately to the right of each of the vertical positions is an address in our pattern table. These values indicate which graphical tiles we are using to create Mario. If I jump, you see each of the four tiles change to the tiles for the hands in the air and the feet apart. Mario lands, and they return to their original values. When Mario turns around, the head graphics trade places and the body graphics trade places. You'll also notice that there is a value to the right of each of these addresses that changes depending on if Mario is facing right or left. It specifies whether the tiles should be flipped horizontally or not. If I freeze all four of them, you can see that Mario's tiles do swap places, but they haven't flipped properly. Let's unfreeze them. Now, what we could do is change the tiles we are using for Mario's head and freeze them. Let's use pattern table values 8A and 88. We'll also freeze the horizontal flip locations. And that's actually a little disturbing. <laughs> this is a pretty crude graphical cheat. We are just forcing tile values to stay the same in two locations in RAM. And since I froze the flip values as well, Mario's head always faces to the right, even if his body faces to the left. This makes climbing the vine also rather creepy. The music change, the vertical position of the sprites, changing Mario's head into Birdo's head, all of this started by simply watching values in RAM as I moved Mario about the screen and performed various actions. It is a good starting point for experimentation. Give it a try and see what you can find. Don't be surprised if you get a bit carried away, which is exactly what happened to me. 
Instead of freezing RAM, I messed around with the lookup table containing which graphics to use for various actions and replaced them with what I thought was the appropriate Birdo head. I used Birdo getting hit by the player for pulling vegetables from the ground and also thought it would be funny if the mouth opened when you jump. Doing something like this makes a lot more sense as a patched ROM. You could just replace the playable character graphics with Birdo graphics and leave the lookup table alone. It would likely make palette changes a bit easier as well. Nevertheless, here are all of the currently active codes you see on the screen right now in case you want a starting point for messing around. Let's talk about animation. If we examine the PPU pattern tables for Doki Doki Panic and the Mario 2 prototype, you can see the water animation cycling on the far right side of the window toward the bottom of the table. For the retail release of Mario 2, Nintendo elected to add more animation to liven things up. The right pattern table in this example shows animation for cherries, tufts of grass, leaves on a vine, the POW block, the potion, and more. Each of these continues to cycle through their frames of animation, but there is a bug. Not all of the intended frames are part of the cycle. This is most easily observed, in my opinion, with the animation of the Albatross. The wings animate downward in a very smooth motion and then snap back to the top. The reason this happens is because the code that is supposed to start the cycle over does so one count earlier than it should. The order of values cycle during the animation code looks like this. Let's skip explaining how the animation loop works and go straight to the problem code. It is just a single line. The code responsible for starting the sequence over loops after we've reached value 26. Oops, 28 is the last number. The good news is that a single statement can be changed so that 26 is instead 28, and that is all it takes to get all eight frames of animation for each of the animated tiles to work properly. A fix has been around for a while and is easily implemented, either via a ROM patch or a single game genie code. Let's check out all of the animations. The original 7 frame sequences are on the left, and the new 8 frame sequences are on the right. The Albatross has one extra frame drawn for when the wings move upward, and the animation appears to be noticeably smoother. Others are a bit more subtle. The cherries used to move faster to the right than they did to the left. Now the movement is much more even. It doesn't really affect gameplay, but it is a nice fix to have. A couple of more notes on animation here. The speed of the waterfall in the retail release was slowed down to be a bit easier on the eyes. You can see how much faster it is in Doki Doki Panic as well as the prototype. Also, I'm not sure if you've noticed this before, but the O in the POW block actually moves a little to the left when it gets to the top of the block. If you would like to move the O of POW back to where it should be, you can manually edit the Mario 2 ROM file and change these values. You can also search for a patch file from the community if you do not wish to edit the ROM yourself. One final bit of trivia for the conversion to Mario 2. In the original Doki Doki Panic, dying would play a short sound effect. In Mario 2, it would only play the short death tune. The sound effect arrives via DPCM, but the sound for Mario 2 mutes DPCM when changing music tracks. This can be restored thanks to a patch. Finally, I think it is worth mentioning that there is at least one revision of the American release of Super Mario Bros. 2. I haven't done a full study of it myself, but it has been documented that at least one of the changes present in the ROM is a bug fix for a problem that can occur while fighting Fry Guy. Fry Guy splits into smaller parts after you have hit him three times. When the player throws a block at one of the mini Fry Guys, he disappears in a puff of smoke. After defeating all of them, a door appears because the boss has been defeated. In the first version of Mario 2, Revision Zero if you will, tossing a mushroom block and defeating a mini Fry Guy while shrinking at the same time due to taking damage will cause any mini Fry Guys hit by the mushroom block to fall off the screen instead of disappear. After defeating the remaining mini Fry Guys, the game will behave as if there are still mini Fry Guys to defeat and the exit will not appear. With nothing left to do, the player has no choice but to reset the game. In Revision 1 of Mario 2, hitting a mini fry guy while shrinking will no longer result in the fall off the screen problem. Well, that was a lot of Mario 2 trivia and code walking. I hope you enjoyed this peek behind the scenes of the international release of Super Mario Bros. 2. Until next time, thanks for watching.